All right, welcome everybody to Science Saturday. And uh, I'm here to take you uh, on a brief journey into an ant colony. And uh, specifically, I'll talk mostly about the army ants, which are the guys you can see here, and about some of the amazing stuff that these ants can do. Like here you can see them form a little cluster on the ceiling of a, of a box, and then they form a chain that allows them to travel to the ground of the box. And you can see some of the ants walking across this chain, while the other ants form the chain by interlinking their legs together. Um, but army ants are by far not the only ants. It turns out that there are more than 14,000 different types of ants in the world, so there's a lot and a lot of ants. And it means that as an ant researcher and ant enthusiast, you never get bored. There's always new stuff that you can look at and discover. And not only are there many different types of ants, there are also just a lot of ants. So if you go to a tropical rainforest, for example, and if you could manage to take all of the ants in that rainforest and you put them on one side of the scale and all of the mammals and all the other big animals, and you put them on the other side of the scale, the ants would be much heavier than all the big animals combined. You can see here this little ant looking out of the scale. But it's actually heavier if you put all of them together than all the big animals. So there's lots of ants and lots of different ants. And as Rick already mentioned, we do some of our field work in one of these tropical rainforests here in Costa Rica. This is what it looks like. And we walk along these muddy trails and we look for army ants. And it turns out that in an army ant colony, there are also many, many ants. And there are many different ants. So this is the army ant queen. She's very, very big. And she's the one individual in the colony, the one ant that lays all the eggs, that does all the reproduction. And then she has many, many workers, worker ants. And in an army ant colony, there can be on the order of a million worker ants. And you can see that the worker ants also all look very different from each other. Some are very small. And those are often the ants that take care of the eggs and the baby ants. And then some ants are very, very big. And they have like really strange mandibles. These are these mouth parts here. A little bit, they look like the teeth of the ant. Um, and I'll show you in a moment what this is. Importantly, all of the ants in an ant colony, they're girls. So there are really no, no boys. There are no male ants in the, inside the colony, at least. So all of these ants in the army ant colony, they're all female. They're all girls. The queen is female, and all the workers are female, too. And these soldiers that I already pointed out to you, they're very good at one thing in particular, and that is to attack big animals that come and want to uh, attack the army ant colony. And here you see one that is biting my finger with these saber-shaped mandibles, and it's also, she's also stinging me here. So it's quite painful. So they're very good at attacking army ant researchers, unfortunately. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to point out here that's really important is the ant's antenna. So this is the part of the body that the ants use to smell, so they don't have a nose like we have, but they smell with their antennae. So they have two of these, and that's really important um, because, of course, the ants, they have to talk to each other, they have to communicate um, if they want to orchestrate all the different cool uh, group behaviors that they perform. They have to be somehow able to talk to each other. And they don't talk to each other with words like we do, but they use chemicals, so-called pheromones, and these are odorants or smells, and the ants have to be able to smell them. And they smell these chemicals with their antennae. So the antennae are very important. And then they have many, many parts of the body that can produce different types of chemicals. Uh, and the different types of chemicals have different types of information. They're a little bit like words or sentences in a language. So the ants speak pheromone. They speak a pheromone language. And to do that, they can, uh, with these, this pheromone language, they can do a lot of really cool things. So for example, the army ants, they're called army ants because they hunt in really large groups. So they send out armies from their colonies, like a little carpet swarm raid that passes through the forest floor. And there are many, many ants in such a swarm raid, often like a few hundred thousand of ants. And they attack, for example, other ant colonies of other ant species. But because there are so many, they can also attack animals that are much, much bigger than the individual ants. So here, for example, they are attacking a katydid, which is related to a grasshopper. And then there can be a few hundred ants that all together run onto this katydid, and they pin it down. Here you see, for example, an ant that grabs a leg of this katydid, so the katydid can't move anymore. And then slowly they cut the katydid into pieces, and then in pieces they carry the katydid back to the nest. So they prey on a lot of different animals in the, in the rainforest. And now, as I showed you in the first slide, where they form a chain, they can also form other structures by interlinking their bodies. So here, for example, they form a bridge between two leaves. There's a gap between the two leaves, and then the other ants can travel over this bridge. 
So they form these structure of live bodies of ants. So they're a little bit like architects, but they built with their own bodies. So they can form bridges, and they even form their own house out of their own bodies. This is called a biwak. And what you can see here again are these chains on the side that provides a little bit of scaffolding of the army ant biwak. And then inside the biwak, there are little tunnels that the ants travel through. There are little chambers where the ants keep their larvae and their, their, baby, lar uh, their baby ants, where the queen sits and lays eggs. And so there's a very complicated structure. It has like ventilation walls, and it's all made up of the ants themselves. And of course, they have to be very good at communicating to, uh, to build something like this. And these are not permanent nests like many other ants do, but they, they only last usually for a day or so. And then at night, the nest gets disassembled. All the ants come apart. And then they move the whole nest uh, for about 100 to 200 meters across the forest floor to new hunting grounds. So then at the next day, they can hunt again in a different part of the forest and find new uh, prey, new animals to eat. And this is what it looks like when they move the nest. All the ants, they walk together in a line. So it's like a, they, they form like a column, a file across the forest floor. And they use this again by using pheromones. They deposit pheromones on the, on the floor. And the ants can then smell the pheromones so they know where they have to go. And they also carry their baby ants. These are these white things here, the larvae. So the ant larva is a little bit what in a butterfly would be the caterpillar. And so the larvae also, they have certain pheromones that make them very attractive to the adult ants. So the adult ants, they know that they have to pick them up and take them with them. So they not only communicate with, the, with each other, but they also communicate uh, with the larvae, with their baby ants. And of course, the ants are also very good at telling ants that come from their own colonies from ants that come from different colonies or different animals. Because of course, the ants, they don't want other ants to wander into their colonies and then, for example, eat their food or even worse, eat their larvae, eat their baby ants. And there are some animals who try to do that. So here you see kind of a standoff. These are actually two different species of army ants, these little red ones here and the big uh, black ones. And they're very good at telling apart who is who. So they know exactly who's from their own colony and who's from the other colony. And so that's, that's why you get these like really uh, standoff lines between the two. So they have these like territorial combats. And again, that works via smell. So they can smell what these guys smell like, and they know what these guys smell like, and they know what an ant has to smell like in order to be from, the, from their own colony versus a different colony. So they're very good at defending their societies, their ant colonies, against intruders, against animals that want to come in and steal their food or cause other types of damage. And you all live in New York City, so you probably have seen some of those. Who of you have seen any of these animals around? Yeah, that's what I thought. They're everywhere, right? You see like cockroaches, you sometimes see them here on the sidewalk, and there are rats, the legendary New York subway rats, and there's pigeons. So these are animals that are very good at infiltrating the human societies, that are very good at living in human cities. But it turns out that there's also animals that are very good to live in, uh, they're very good at living in army ant city. And they usually do that by cracking this army ant language. So they have some ways of, for example, reading the army ant trail pheromones, so they can do that to find the, the army ant colony or to follow the army ants as they move. And they often also smell like the army ants. So when an army ant comes and touches an animal like this with their antennae, they can't tell that it's, an, that it's a different animal. They think it's an ant from their own colony. And what you can see here is a little bit more of ant anatomy. So here, this is called the ant's gaster, which is kind of the back part of the ant. And in this particular army ant, it looks like it has two of these back parts. It has two gasters. But it's actually not true. This thing up here is a beetle. And the beetle has clamped itself to, to this little part of the ant, and it rides on the ant. And you can see here are the legs of the beetle. The beetle really retracts the legs to put them very close to its body. So the ants, they can't snatch the, the beetle's legs and bite it into the legs. It really looks like a little ball, very much like the, like the ant's back part. And this beetle we discovered on one of our uh, fieldwork trips in Costa Rica. And then colleagues of mine actually named it after me. So it's called Nymphista cronauri. So now I have a beetle that has my name. And it's not only any beetle. It's a beetle that looks like an ant's butt. And I know. <laughs> You think that that's silly, but I think it's great. And I think I also know uh, what the ants has to say about this. <laughs> it basically, it's forced to walking around with a beetle on its butt for the whole day. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about what army ants do in the field. But of course, we also have ants in the lab here, and we can study how they behave and what they do and how they talk to each other with pheromones. 
And this is a setup here where we can have many, many different ant colonies. They're much, much smaller than the army ant colonies in the field. Every one of these little dishes has a whole ant colony inside it. And all the ants that are in such a dish, they have two color dots on the back, and they have different combination of color dots, so they look a little bit like walking Easter eggs or something. And we can use these color dots to tell all the different ants apart, so we know exactly who's who in all of these different ant colonies, and we can follow their behavior because we have little cameras in the ceiling of the setup. And I'll just show you one video, uh, how they communicate. This is such an ant colony. And you can see that the nest of the ants is in this little chamber here, and then they have a bigger chamber in which they can forage. And there's one ant that has walked outside and has found some food here, and now there's another one that's coming, it's doing a little exploration run, but it doesn't find anything really, so it just goes back inside, doesn't do anything. And then at some point this one decides that the food is really good, and now it walks back and it lays one of these pheromone trails. And you see in a minute why I say that it's a pheromone trail. You can't see it yet. And now it walks inside and it tells the other ants with a chemical that there's good food outside. <laughs> but they, go, oh, they all get very excited. They run out and they follow this pheromone trail and they right away find the food. And then of course they start to drag the food back into the colony. So here they use like two different pheromones, probably two different chemicals to orchestrate this foraging behavior in the ants. And I want to leave you with a quote from a very famous ant biologist, Ed Wilson. And he wrote in a recent book of his, I have never changed, not even to this day, as I pass through my 80s, encountering creatures in unexplored lands is the magic I still conjure in my dreams. The inner feelings remain the same. I did not let them be smothered by the trivial necessities of life, and I hope that whatever path you choose, neither will be you. But I should say that you don't really have to go to Costa Rica or other faraway lands to find uh, unexplored lands and creatures. Actually, your local park or your backyard is pretty unexplored if you think about it. So this is my son Max here. He is going to turn five uh, in two weeks from now. And this is a picture I took last weekend where we were looking for ants in New York, in Libet upstate. And he's pointing at some ants that lived under rock. And at the end, I just will tell you a few stories about some of the favorite ants that uh, live around here. So I, I told you in the beginning, there are about 14,000 ants worldwide but there are several hundred ants that you can find in New York State, and a lot of them actually also in New York City and Central Park, for example. So these, for example, are called citronella ants. They're yellow, and they are called citronella ants because they smell a little bit like lemon, like citrus, especially when you crush them. <laughs> and here they are shown with their larvae, so they also take very good care of their larvae, but what they also do is they keep aphids, a different type of insect, inside their nest, and they're very fond of these aphids, so they protect the aphids, and what the aphids do in return is they produce like a sugary drink that's called honeydew. It tastes a little bit like lemonade, and these ants, they absolutely love the aphid lemonade. So they keep the aphids and they drink from the aphid lemonade, and in turn, they protect the aphids. So that's called a mutualism. It's two species that work closely together, and one helps the other. This is a different type of ant that you can find around here. Um, this is a little bit of a scary story. It's called a Dracula ant. And it's called a Dracula ant because these ants behave a little bit like vampires. What they do is they pierce the skin of their larvae and they drink the blood of the larvae. <clears throat> but the larvae are used to it. They don't die. They don't really get hurt. It's a very sophisticated way for the colony to share their food. So the larvae are the ones that get fed and they can digest a lot of food and then they feed it back to the workers. But they do it by letting the workers piece, piece, piece their cuticle and letting them drink their, their blood. This is another type of ant. These are called slave-making ants. They also occur around here. And if you open a nest of, the, of those guys, if you flip over a rock, you find that there's two different types of ants often in the colony. So here you see this kind of red ant and then a more blackish ant. And what happens here is that one of these ants, the slave-maker ant, they go out and they steal ants from other colonies. And then they bring them back to their own colonies. And then these slave ants, they have to work for the slave-maker ants inside the colonies. Also, not a very nice thing but it's another thing that ants do. So um, if you want to hear more about ants, you can come to our ant booth. It's located on the third floor of the CRC, the Collaborative Research Center, in room 306. And we have live ants there, uh, and a lot of people from my lab who are happy to tell you more about ants. We have ant movies, and a lot of ant pictures, ant necklaces, and all kinds of other ant merchandise. <laughs> and of course, again, uh, welcome to Rockefeller University, and uh, I hope you'll have fun and enjoy Science Saturday.